Nation. Hooray. Hooray. Thank you so much. And I have to say, um, we can go to my slides already. I, I have to say thank you to the sound guy, right? So before I was a social worker, before I had a PhD, I was a theater major, and so sound guys were always my friends. So we owe them a big thanks. Thank you very much. So I am the executive director of the Death with Dignity National Center. It's a position that I've held for nine years, so I've been around for a while, and I've seen some exciting wins and some horrible losses. I'm also an adjunct instructor of social work at Portland State University, um, and so I have this two, I have a du dual track sort of policy person and academic, um, and that's kind of what this presentation is drawn from. So we are going to look at death with dignity from a couple of different perspectives. First of all, we are just going to do an overview of what death with dignity is. For those folks who live in Oregon or Washington or Vermont, they may have a strong knowledge of what the law is, or for those folks who have ties to the old Hemlock Society who are, or who have been exposed to this issue may know, but other of us, some of us haven't even heard of this, right? Some of us don't even understand or know about um, some of the things that are going on about dying. So I'm gonna do an overview. And then the second part of my presentation is, I'm calling it impediments to policy reform, but we could also call it the Catholic Church. <laughs> that, could, that could be all what that last thing just says is the Catholic Church. So first of all, the Oregon Death with Dignity Act. So what death with dignity is, is that it's a state policy, which is a law, right? That's what a policy is. Um, and it's in Oregon, implemented in 97. In Washington, they've had it since 2009. In Vermont, since just last year. And this policy provides a state-sanctioned process. That means the state oversees a process for patients, for terminally ill individuals to follow, to re request and receive a prescription from their physician to hasten death so that they can determine the timing and the manner of their own death. And it's a safeguarded process. The, lo the law is about 10 pages long. You can actually read it in the Oregon statutes. It's um, pretty straightforward and pretty easy to read. And it, about half of it is all about the safeguards, right? That, because that is so important to the process. And the final thing that Death with Dignity provides is guidelines for pharmacists and physicians to follow, right? So what does a physician need to do if his or her patient says to them, I want to hasten my death? What does a pharmacist do when he or she, she receives that prescription? So that's what the Oregon Death with Dignity Act is. It's about what the patient has to do, what the pharmacy has to, pharmacist has to do, and what the doctor has to do. And there are a series of underlying principles um, that guide the Death with Dignity Act. One of our board members, whose name is Eli Stutzman, wrote the law. And as a social worker, I'm sort of interested in what underlies the text of the law, right? What is, what is it that goes into who made the law? And so he gave me these underlying principles, and I think they're pretty darn good. Um, it's a patient-controlled process, right? So that means every step of the way, it's the patient. It's not euthanasia, it's not someone else making the decision, it's not a daughter or a husband or a spouse making the decision or a physician or a healthcare institution. It is the patient, right? That patient has choice. The second underlying principle in the Death with Dignity Act is uh, this idea that there's choice for everyone involved. So if you are a physician who thinks it's wrong, if you are a pharmacist who thinks you shouldn't be doing this, you don't have to participate. We can find people who will, right? And we have in Oregon. And so we want there to be choice for all participants. Um, it's a prescribing only law, and I talked about that earlier, but there's um, no injections, there's no, it is not a euthanasia law. Euthanasia is actually specifically banned in the text of the Oregon Death with Dignity Act. Um, what it also does, it, it, is that it codifies a medical standard of care. So one of our challenges to the profession of medicine is to say, we know that you're doing this every day in every state. You are practicing this. You are helping your patients die. 
And, and we know this, there have been articles published in the New England Journal of Medicine, in JAMA, that, um, that are um, overviews or studies of physicians, and physicians say we do this. And what we say in Oregon, Washington, and Vermont is that it is a process that can no longer be a shadow process. We have to have guidelines, we have to have state sanctioning, we have to have reporting, and we are not going to hide it in hush whispers in the hospitals. That's not okay. Thank you. The last two things that it does is it um, uses le legislation to define who qualifies. Um, so that um, sort of identifies if you are a patient, what you have to do to qualify, and use of legislation to protect vulnerable um, individuals, which a state has an interest in doing. That's what happens when you pass a state law, right? We're offering a certain right to a certain group of individuals, but the state is also doing what it needs to do to protect vulnerable individuals. And so we have a good balance with Oregon's death with dignity law doing what laws should do. So to qualify in Oregon, Washington, and Vermont, so the last point is they're all nearly identical, so I'll say that now. So to qualify in either of those three states or any of those three states, you have to have a diagnosis of a terminal illness with a prognosis of less than six months from two physicians, right? So two docs have to say, your terminal condition will likely lead to your death in six months. That's the first thing that you have to do to qualify. Both physicians um, must determine, so both of them must determine that you are mentally competent to make healthcare decisions. You can't be so depressed that you cannot make healthcare decisions for yourself. You can't have dementia where you can't make decisions for yourself. So both doctors have to say that um, you are mentally competent to make healthcare decisions. You have to be a resident. What a resident is is defined by the state legislature. You have to be an adult. Um, you have to go through three requests. So if you want to do this, you have to ask your doctor three different ways um, to prescribe for you. You have to go through two waiting periods, one of 15 days and one of two days. And um, a little bit just about that second point, um, the mental competence point, if one of those doctors determines that you're not mentally competent, you have to go through a psychiatric review and be determined to, by a psychiatrist or a psychologist to be mentally competent before you can go forward to qualify. So the Oregon Death with Dignity Act, we consider it model legislation. In Oregon, it's just the state of what it is. It's been around for 16 years. Support ranges in the 75 to 82, 83%. So the folks in our state um, just accept, accept it as established policy. It was written by an attorney um, from Oregon who came to the issue from a religious studies class. Um, he was exposed to it um, in, in a college class and um, became an attorney and really sort of um, grappled with the issue and wrote the Oregon Death with Dignity Act um, from that perspective. It was passed by an initiative direct to the people in 1994. So about, is it 27 states have the ballot initiative process? And um, so it was passed by the ballot initiative process in 1994 and with a margin of 51 to 49. That's actually pretty high for a, that's a big margin for a state election. It had strong support. Um, immediately upon passage, a federal district court judge in Oregon issued an injunction on implementation. So this judge said, you can't do it, right? The people passed it, but you can't do it. And the thing is, is that was really good for Oregon, because this is the first in the nation and the first in the world type of legislation, and we needed time to implement. And that judge, who thought that he was stamping us down, actually gave us the time to have a valid and well-established law. Uh, the Oregon legislature sent the law back to the people for reapproval in, um, in 1997. So the Oregon legislature had not done that in a hundred years, right? They hadn't taken a ballot initiative that was passed by the people and sent it back to the people to say, did you really mean that? And the people of Oregon said, yeah, we really meant it. 
We really want this law. And so since then, it has been established in Oregon. So that injunction was lifted in 1997, days before the election, the second election. And the law has been continuously implemented in Oregon since then. So that's 16 years of data that we have. Um, so the, the attacks in Oregon, unfortunately, weren't the only attacks that the, that the law has experienced. We saw um, the religious right has really come out against death with dignity in many, many different ways. And in 2001, John Ashcroft, George Bush's um, attorney general, issued the Ashcroft Directive, which said that he was going to prosecute Oregon pharmacists and physicians who were lawfully practicing under the death with dignity law in our state. And um, this challenge wound its way all the way up to the Supreme Court, which ruled in our favor um, in 2006. And it was Chief Justice John Roberts' first big case. And um, we won that case um, pretty definitively. And the text of the, the decision is just wonderful reading if John Ashcroft ever made you mad. In, the, in your experience with politics, because the Supreme Court profoundly reiterated over and over again that he had exceeded his authority in trying to attack Oregon, that he had misinterpreted the Controlled Substances Act, and he had stepped out of bounds. He and President Bush and um, Alberto Gonzalez, who was the attorney general that replaced him. And so the Supreme Court really said, no, you can't do that. And so the Oregon's law has, withstand all, has withstood all legal challenges since that point. So what's been the impact in Oregon in 16 years? Um, there's been this gradual, if you look at the state statistics, which are easily Googleable, you can find um, the, every year they have to issue a report about who uses the law. And you see this gradual, very slow upward decline. So one of the things that happened is that our opponents argued when, in 94 that people would rush to Oregon to use the law, right? They would put tents on our beaches, our beautiful open beaches, and they would take the medications and die there, and Oregon would become a destination state. And the reality is that only 100 or 125 people use it a year go through that process to qualify. And so very, very, we're talking very, very small numbers of people. Very, very small numbers of people. One of the interesting things about the Death with Dignity Act is about 35 to 40% of people who qualify, who get a prescription, don't take it to hasten their death, right? It's all about peace of mind. It's all about this idea that if I have a terminal illness and I am suffering, then maybe I can live until tomorrow, and I can enjoy my life and my family today, and if it gets really bad, I can take the medication tomorrow. So really, to me, when I talk to people who are considering this law, who or who have qualified, for all of them, it's all about peace of mind. I can take control of this, I can just determine the timing and manner of my own death, and my doctor can't tell me no, and my family can't either. And so that's really an important piece, that it's not just about hastening your death, but it's about controlling the end of your life. Since implemented in those 16 years, 1,173 people have qualified and 750 people have hastened their death using the medication. So again, it's that 35 to 40% of people don't take it over time. Most people have cancer, as you might anticipate. Most people are older than 65. Um, most people die at home. It's interesting. The statistics tell us that about 50% of Americans with terminal illness die at home. And in Oregon, we just absolutely flipped that, right? People die at home where they want to die. And 86% are under hospice care. So what has been the impact on the greater process of dying in Oregon? Um, and this has been sort of fascinating. Hospice was once an opponent, and they have become much, much more supportive because all the data demonstrates that Oregon has become a leader in how we die. It's become a leader in dying well. And so we are a national leader in the percentage of, of people who get to die at home where they want to die, um, in high rates of hospice referral, so we have strong hospice penetration. Um, high use of opioids to 
um, to address pain issues. So a lot of people in Oregon who have pain issues have their pain well controlled. That's a very serious issue. Um, we have a statewide poll system um, that is, is groundbreaking. It's actually um, different than any other state that has, although many states are adopting it, um, where your medical directive is a part of your medical chart which is, is just groundbreaking ideas. And palliative care training for physicians, healthcare workers is um, higher in Oregon than almost any other state. So not only have we seen the impact of it on individuals, but we've seen the positive impact on palliative care and hospice in Oregon altogether. So where's the movement today, right? Like that's the question. 2008, Washington en enacted the law. 2013, Vermont. In 2009, the Montana Supreme Court ruled that there was nothing in their criminal statute that allowed for prosecution of physicians, right? But there's no codified death with dignity law, so we don't see a lot of physicians using it because they don't have full protection yet. Um, but there is a quasi-legal status in Montana. And what we've seen most excitingly is momentum in, in New England where we're likely to see one or two more states succeed in policy reform in the next four years. Um, and I, I mentioned this earlier and lots of people had questions kind of in the interim, the break, about what's happening outside of death with dignity states. If I don't um, live in one of those states, what are my options? Um, and I, I said earlier, physicians all over in every state are helping people um, assist in their dying. Um, but the practice is unevenly applied. In fact, it has something to do with privilege, right? If you have access to your physicians, if you have money to be a private pay, you have access to de death with dignity more likely than folks that don't have regular health care. So it's not universally available, it's based on privilege, it's not governed by a standard of care, and it's carried out in hush whispers around the country. So what are the impediments to reform? The Catholic Church. Um, the first thing, that, this is just a little thing, if you're thinking, um, if you're comparing it to other social movements, we're really young. Um, we're so very young. I'm just going to flip to the next slide. We're so very young in comparison to other social movements. So the marriage equality, the LGBT marriage movement, you can argue that it started with Stonewall in 69, or Choice really had its big decision in 73 with Roe v. Wade. But the first attempts, true attempts at death with dignity were not until 1991. So we're almost 20 years younger than the other movements that are experiencing sort of progressive success right now. And so I think that sometimes when people think about why aren't you having all these states succeed, one of the issues is, is we're just so young. We're, we're not quite there yet. The second thing that I think is an impediment to reform is the death taboo. And the death taboo is very strong in American culture, and there's some reasons for it. One of the reasons is that medical technology has changed how we die. 50 years ago, if you had a heart attack, you probably died, right? If you got diabetes, you didn't live a long life. If you got cancer, there wasn't chemotherapy. If you got pneumonia, we called old man's friend, right? And you died from that. And so how we die medically has changed, but our policies haven't kept up with this idea that what do we say to physicians when we want it to stop, right? We just don't have in 47 states, a way to say to our physician, I want this medical technology to stop. A, a fourth thing that, uh, about the death taboo that I might say is that doctors sometimes construe death as a professional failure, right? So there's a, an identity piece built into doctors that they want to um, treat, treat, treat. And we see that, and that's part of this whole death taboo. I might give you an example. Um, from, your, from the conference earlier today, one of the, the symptoms, I think, of the death taboo is the use of euphemisms. So even in um, the literature from this free thinking organization, I see that we are having a memorial service to honor our fallen colleagues. So the use of the word fallen is a euphemism, and it's part of this death taboo in our culture. And I pointed out just to say, how hard it is to say that our friends died, right? That to use that language is, is very, very difficult. So one more thing about death 
um, taboo in lawmakers, about 60 to 64 percent of Americans support death with dignity legislation, no matter when you ask them or how you ask them or what state they're from, whether they're Catholic or not. You know, it, just 60 to 64 percent of Americans on average support it, but legislators are terrified of death. Right? And if you think about the whole death panel thing, where an early version of Obamacare was derailed when the Tea Party said that it contained language that would establish a panel of people who would determine whether people with disabilities or old people would live or die. Right? It was completely debunked. It was called a lie. Right? We all knew it was a lie, and yet it was successfully used to de derail some important piece of legislation. So the death taboo is really strong in our culture. And the, the last thing, so we're a policy organization. That's what we do. We work for political reform and political advocacy, and our main opponent continually is the Catholic Church. It's certainly not people who are Catholic, because people who are Catholic support death with dignity at the same rates as people who are not Catholic. So it's not the people, it's the institution of the church. And historically, the church has contributed more than half of the money to run political campaigns against death with dignity reform. And it was really hard to find these numbers, but we did. And so the, these are one, two, three, four, seven situations um, where death with dignity was debated at um, a ballot initiative and the amount of money that the, ca the Catholic Church spent in each of those states. So 64% of the opponent's budget in Washington in a death with dignity effort was fr directly from the Catholic Church. 60% in California in a failed attempt for death with dignity in 92. 59% um, in Oregon in 94. Much more in Oregon in 97 when the legislature sent it back. Um, Michigan, not so much in Michigan in uh, 1998. 1.3 million in Maine, and 70, um, that was 74% of the opponent's budget, and just about 50% in Washington in 2008. So we just ran a campaign in Massachusetts um, in 2012, which we lost um, by about 1% of the vote. It was, a, it was a horrendous loss. It was in um, 2012. And the opponents in Massachusetts spent 4.8 million, and 3.4 million of that money came from the Catholic Church. So a full 71% of the money against death with dignity in um, Massachusetts came from the Catholic Church. A million from Catholic TV, a million from the seminary. And I want to read this little list. So 60 dioceses and archdioceses from around the country thought it was so important to send their money to Massachusetts to help determine how the people of Massachusetts died. So if you look at this, the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, Texas sent $5,000 to Massachusetts to help determine how the people died there. Kansas City, the Archdiocese of Kansas City, 10,000. Oklahoma City, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Atlanta, Anchorage, Providence, Rhode Island, Des Moines, Gary, Newton, Pittsburgh. So the list goes on and on of these small archdioceses all over the country sending money to Massachusetts to determine how the people of Massachusetts died. The Catholic Church was all in in its opposition to Massachusetts. And I think there was this fascinating quote um, a couple of days after the election um, from the campaign manager. I will say that the campaign manager against death with dignity was the campaign manager who was against um, gay marriage in the early days in Massachusetts. So he has this um, experience um, working against the, these types of um, civil rights reforms. And he said, this was a fight its opponents felt they couldn't afford to lose, right? The Catholic Church couldn't afford to lose this. If the proponents could pass this in 40% Catholic Massachusetts, they'd be running through the other states within five years. So the Catholics knew that if we won, that we would have a whole bunch of individuals who would be able to determine the timing and manner of their death which is against Catholic teaching. And so because of Catholic beliefs, they wanted to stop it for everyone. And that is what happened in Massachusetts. 
Um, the opponent messaging, no one mentioned, right, Catholic doctrine, Catholic um, teachings, the papal encyclicals, no one said anything about that. They put up doctors and they put up people with disabilities to say the law was bad, right? So $3.4 million spent, but not one mentioned that it was Catholic, not one piece of ownership that it was their money, it was religious money being used to finance this election. And so where do we go from here? Um, the Catholic money, it's interesting, I think we've all been, uh, I, I'm, I guess I'm making an assumption, but I have found Pope Francis's statements to be interesting. I'm following them with much intrigue, right? What's he going to do? He seems to be more open. He sort of suggested that we have um, he said the church has sometimes locked itself up in small things, in small-minded rules. The people of God want pastors, not clergy, acting like bureaucrat or government officials. What that means, we don't really know, right? Are they really going to step out of elections? We don't know. The choice movement doesn't know. The queer movement doesn't know. We don't have a meaning. But we do hope that they step out because of the way the Death with Dignity Act is written is if they don't want to use it because of their religious beliefs, then they don't have to use it, but they don't get to decide for the rest of us. Thank you. I have just one more thing to add. I, um, we have a booth in the exhibitor hall. I would be happy to talk to any of you. If you have questions, I'll be there later today and most of tomorrow. So please come and chat me up. I'd love to talk. Thanks. <laughs>